thanks very much and thank you um, for having me. Um, yeah, I, I was um, really lucky to have been invited along to join an expedition to dive uh, the Britannic in 2019. Um, before I go on much further, I will just point out that the expedition was sponsored by O3. And so there's a load of pictures of their logo there with stickers, which I, I stick wherever I can. <clears throat> so what makes it, what makes Britannic so sort of special and what's so, so different about it is one of the one of the only sort of wrecks that's diveable that has has real links to that most epic of all shipwrecks the Titanic uh, being Titanic's sister vessel um, or one of them there were there were three they were they were known as Olympic class ships uh, the Olympic was the first one um, followed by the Titanic and then after that, Britannic came along. Um, the Olympic actually uh, survived the First World War, carried on working, and it, in the 1930s was scrapped. And nobody really knows much about that anymore because it, it sort of its life was what it was meant to be. So it's only Titanic, which obviously sank on its maiden voyage, and Britannic, that was uh, sunk when it hit a mine, that um, that have sort of um, fueled the imagination. You know, the film films have been made on um, obviously the famous one, Titanic, but there's actually a film about Britannic as well. Um, in many books, you can even get a, a Lego model of Britannic, which uh, there aren't many ships that you can uh, dive that you can go and get a, a Lego model of. Um, there's even a new book out there, which uh, which I happen to have, uh, have, have written, which some of you might have seen. Um, it's available from um, dived up publications, uh, or you, you know you can get it on Amazon, Waterstones, what 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 have you. Um, so if if any of you want to know a bit more, see see the pictures in uh, in on paper and in your hand, then that's the thing to uh, to go and think about getting. So where is Britannic? Um, she lies um, off the southern. Greek mainland, um, just just north of an island called Kia. Um, you can all see the map uh, of Greece and uh, the the smaller bit, which is a bit of bit of hydrographic chart um, of Kia Island, and showing the dive site, the, the the wreck site of the the Britannic hospital ship. Um, you can see it's in a general depth of about 114 meters, with a with a top depth of 84 meters um so it's yeah it's a it's a bit deep um obviously we, we all had to get there um and it involved taking a massive amount of equipment um through the whole of europe to 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 get it to kia kia island has a has a paddy dive center called kia divers who who did support us but they had a limited supply of um stage cylinders and rebreather cylinders uh, we also all wanted to take scooters and and personal equipment all the rebreathers it's difficult um or if if not impossible would it would have been for us to have each flown out with all the kit we needed um you know the airlines would have just laughed at us um the 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 bottom central photograph is my kit that i was taking um and uh, as you can see, four four big boxes and two small cases and a load of cylinders um, plus a scooter. Uh, you know, it all adds up. And so, the, uh, so there was one of the team members, a chap called Steve Pry, who lives actually up in Inverness, um, donated his his van uh, to the cause, and and it drove all the way down through the UK, picking up kit on the way down through the Channel Tunnel, and then all the way to Greece via, I think they went to um, Venice, and then it was a three-day ferry ride to Piraeus, which is just north of Athens, and then the final short drive and ferry to get to actually get to Kia itself. Um, we all met up in Athens. Obviously, had a morning to go and explore, went to see the Acropolis, which is quite spectacular, despite all the crowds. Um, this is this is the team um, or some of the team. Uh, we were a, a, a mixed bunch, um, mainly UK, 
but we also had uh, a couple of American divers and uh, one, one guy from Australia uh, on the team. Several people did take photographs, um, but I think I, I was the only one with a, with a, a, a housed DSLR uh, type or mirrorless camera um, on, on the trip. <clears throat> So we, uh, this was the final ferry where the, this um, central picture is, is our van. Uh, we went down to Lavrio Port, um, which is right at the bottom of it. Can you see my mouse cursor? So the short hop, which is an, an hour's um, ferry ride from, from Lavrio to, to Kia Island. Um, and then we got, we got to Kia, um, which was a you know, typical Greek island, actually. Um, this building, uh, sort of at the bottom uh, left of centre is the, is the dive centre that was going to be our base of operations and um, top um, right this beige building was was an enormous Airbnb that enabled each person to have their own uh, room which was was actually really nice and, you know you don't you didn't there was no risk of having to sleep with anyone who snored which was uh, which was great uh, Obviously, on a Greek island, you expect building sites, and this was a hotel that was being built next door. It was actually be being worked on while we were there. And um, th this is the port of Vukari, which uh, is around the corner, which we'll see a bit more of uh, in, in uh, later uh, images. So this is our accommodation. And uh, yeah, this is the the sort of high street of Vukari. Uh, it's it's a, a destination for the flotilla sailing holidays, and so at certain times of each week, you you get you get um, a, a crowd of boats moored up here. Um, but the, the the benefit of it is that there are a load of good restaurants here, which uh, was great for our relaxation and recreation. <clears throat> this is a team photograph just before the expedition started um, and that was the view from our balcony looking out towards the Greek mainland. Um, the name, that, that's a small lighthouse, but the name of which evades me, I'm afraid. <clears throat> so the first thing we had to do was to get to get everything um, ready, uh, which obviously involved, it involved a lot of organisation and emptying the van of all the kit we brought getting the kit into into its right sort of to its right owner uh, having it labeled correctly uh, and so on uh, we were all diving with rebreathers so we'd had delivered to Kia divers a, a pallet load of the softener line which is the carbon dioxide absorbent that the rebreathers use <clears throat> A couple of people wanted to sort of do weight checks and so on before we actually got on with the diving, um, which, you know, there, there was ability to do that. The boat we were we were going to be diving from was um, a little bit unconventional. You know, it was a traditional Greek fishing boat um, with a with a, a the gesture to, towards diving was that they had a, a platform and a and a ladder attached to it. Um, it worked for our purposes, but um, it would have been difficult if if the weather had been more challenging. Um, but uh, we were also accompanied by a fast rib, which acted as a sort of support vessel. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the photography before I sort of move on to the diving. Um, before the trip, I had used a, a D500 uh, in a Nauticam housing, which is rated to 100 meters. The Britannic is obviously deeper than that. It's um, 116, 17 meters. Um, and so I, I decided I needed to do something to um, cope with, with that. One option was actually to send the D500 housing back to Nauticam and get them to upgrade all the springs and so on inside it to, to make it workable to the greater depths. But um, that was going to take time and I sort of decided that it was going to be better to think about a, a, a new camera and I decided to go with uh, a Nikon Z6. Um, the Nikon, because I'd got the Nikon infrastructure, I wouldn't wouldn't have to sort of buy completely different lenses and so on. I could use, I already had the 8 to 15 uh, fisheye zoom 
um, which I'd be able to put on it as, is, would be the main lens that I'd be using for the trip. Um, so I decided to get a, um, a Z, they call it a Z7 housing, but it's, it's used for both the six and the seven, uh, which was rated to 150 meters. Um, <clears throat> the, the other reason for changing to the Z6 was that it's, it's full frame and had allegedly class leading low light performance um, and um, in addition, the the live view shooting um, with the camera was was far in ex excess better than the D500. I don't know if any of you have got D500s and tried using live view for for shooting, and there's a real shutter lag when you uh, when you try and use it. Um, with the Z6 and 7, you you just don't get that. It's instantaneous. <clears throat> So I, I ended up doing a load of work up dives. Remember, we were diving in um, uh, May, so the work up dives had to be within UK winter winter season mainly. Uh, so I, I spent far too much time diving in uh, Vobster, Endac, and Cromhall, uh, which were all are all thankfully equidistant from where I live. So in in each case, about a forty minute drive which uh, made life a lot easier because diving the same quarry over and over again although it might be good for your skills it gets a bit tedious um, so uh, it, it was quite nice and it, and it was quite nice to spend some time thinking about the photography there um, we we were told that we should use scooters on um, Britannic so I and the reason for using scooters is that the currents can be quite fierce um, <clears throat> to the point where I, I don't know if many of you know Al Wright, who's um, the, the skipper of ex skipper of Salate now, now is the skipper of um, Sea Leopard down in Portland. He was telling me that when he went to dive the Britannic, he was unable to get to the wreck on the first day because the current was so fierce he was hauling himself down the shot line and only got as far as 60 meters before he decided it was it was just too difficult to do um, and he, he then resorted to using a scooter which made the whole process a lot easier um, so we we everyone on the trip went w equipped with a scooter and I, I went with this one which is made by um, a company called Dive Extras in, in the States. It's a nice dinky one, it's not a cave scooter, it's a more of a wreck scooter, which is obviously what you want for Britannic. Um, but I, I decided that I needed to mount my camera on the scooter to enable me to um, use it effectively. Carrying carrying the, the camera separately to the scooter, it meant that it would be all sort of being not around by my stage cylinders and so on which just wouldn't wouldn't work very well so I, st I started using a you know a simple tripod plate but it, it just didn't work it kept falling off and was a bit of a disaster but uh, I eventually found this thing which is from this company called Yellow Diving they're in Poland I think in in, in Europe and they um, make this quite uh, quite neatly engineered um, solution to the problem you just need two um, tripod bolts to attach it to the bottom of the camera and uh, and and it's done and it meant that you could have you could have the thing facing forwards uh, but what what I found was that if when using it if you stop you then twist the camera around or as, as in the right hand picture and you can use the camera as per normal um, and so that, that's what I was using over there um, the one of one of the things about the photography um, and th these are all images of the same wreck, um, which is the uh, Justicia, which lies in 70 metres off Malin Head, um, off, the, uh, off Ireland. Um, and you can see the difference. I, 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 I put some settings up. So this, the top left one is an ambient light shot taken at ISO 6400, f2.8 and a 50th of a second. Um, the one on the the right is obviously the one with 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 strobes where we're, we're, we're still opening up the aperture quite quite a lot but it, you can see how it really darkens down the background um and then then the one at the at the bottom is also the 6400 um in fact the same settings as as the ambient light one but with the added um 
uh, video light uh, attached to it. So I, I've, I've for many years gone through this sort of um, dilemma of what's the best kit to use when you've got clear water but there's not a lot of light um, and um, it, it was this toss-up of whether you use video lights or use strobes um, and I sort of came down uh, along the along the route of um, video lights actually working better for my purposes so on the, on the on this one um, top right image this is in Endak, it's at about 70 meters, it's very dark down there. So we've, we've got uh, the, the upper diver holding this, this powerful video light and he's, he's lighting up the scene below, which, which I think gives a much better effect. If I'd used strobes, the, the, the closest diver would have been uh, lit up, but um, everything else lower than that would be um, uh, dark. And, and I wouldn't have been able to use the, the high ISO to get some background detail that's there. Um, similar on, on, uh, on the, the, the image below. If the visibility is not good, this way of doing things doesn't work. You then have to go back old school and, and crank the ISO back down again. But I wasn't expecting that in, uh, in Greece. <clears throat> So um, video lights are useful at lower ISOs. The, again, this is this is a the top left shot, a uh, much more sort of reasonable amount of ambient light there. So uh, certainly a lesser ISO uh, and, sh and a slightly higher shutter speed. But you can see how the uh, using a powerful video light adds colour to the, uh, the the shipwreck. And then on this one on the right hand side, I, I managed to get a, a, a commended on UPY for this shot which um, as you can see there are, there are a multitude of offboard lights nothing on camera at all it's all all offboard eight there are eight uh, offboard video lights uh, on this one which which en enables you to light up the wreck and give the wreck some depth as well uh, and I, I was hoping to do similar sort of things on Britannic um, we did a bit of um, pre-dive planning I'm not going to go too much into that but basically bottom line we'd have a rebreather three aluminium 80 cylinders which each weigh about um, 15 kilograms uh, scooter for me a camera so the total diving weight is somewhere between 150 and 200 kilograms it's a it, it is a, a massive amount of weight that we're we as divers we're carrying and um, <clears throat> before we got to dive britannic though we we had something with a slightly more modest depth. Um, this wreck is called the um, SS Berdigala, uh, and it was a French liner, which was being used um, as a troop ship. Um, and was actually, it actually hit a mine about a week or 10 days or so before Britannic was sunk. The authorities at the time didn't put two and two together and conclude that there must be a, a um, minefield in the area. Um, but uh, this this one succumbed to uh, the the same minefield that 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 got Britannic. Um, the the depth here is about 55 meters, and there was actually quite a lot of ambient light, and so the uh, the ISO is is quite uh, quite low compared to some of the shots that you're going to see. Um, th th this was this was an amazing wreck, and it and it's a wreck that that's that stands in its in its in its own stead as a stunning dive uh, i think as you can see there it's uh, it is quite special um the um we top left we've got uh, the fore deck the, there are two guns the one on the uh, the right hand side is pointing out to see the the one on the left is sort of along the the the, the deck level so it's more difficult to see and then um on the right we've got a a picture of the prop. The seabed depth here was about 70 meters. Um, so it's definitely an armed merchant cruiser. Um, I'm, I'm putting the the camera settings on here because as, as photographers you'd probably be interested in in seeing what what's what. Sometimes I can't explain why 
one shot is so different to the other you know we've got the uh, the top left which has got a lot of color in it which has been introduced by video lights uh, but the ISO is 2000 um, and I'm, I'm surprised I made it as high as that but that, that's what it is um, from reading reading the uh, the figures in Lightroom whereas the one um, on the right of the gun ISO 500 and uh, it's, it still looks looks quite good but there's, there's obviously very little color uh, uh, in it so it's one of the only wrecks that um, has got a, a, an intact bell on it so um, this thing here is is the bell that believe it or not there is a second bell uh, on a on a uh, on a mast uh, hanging off the starboard side of the ship um, and the other thing that's really fascinating is it has all the bridge gear so telegraphs um, compass binnacles they're all there uh, which which is just fascinating and, and amazing to see um, there aren't many many ships you know in, in the UK <laughs> that sort of stuff is just immediately removed and, and taken away but the the Greeks have the, the interesting thing is that this this wreck was only found about less than 10 years ago and um, the Greeks are very strict with um, what's allowed and, and basically they said nothing should be removed and so the bell the two bells they actually think there is another bell towards the stern of the ship uh, which is currently covered in old fishing net which at some stage they're hoping to remove anyway back to britannic so um you you might be wondering how we got in to the water carrying 200 kilograms of, uh, of kit well you don't stagger across the deck and and climb the steps and jump you you have your rebreather on your back and you walk to the exit point which is the, this bit on on the boat and then these three um guys who are our support team then load you up with all the equipment so uh, you can see on the left hand shot here they're just clipping cylinders onto oh this is scott roberts who's the expedition leader um, and then finally he's got everything ready he's got his uh, scooter uh, and all his stages ready to go and the boat will then maneuver into position and off he jumps into the water um, so in, in effect we were loaded up standing at the exit point we just had to make one step and we were in the water which was actually far easier than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, it was one of the things that made me really consider whether I, I was up to the job because the thought of um, staggering across a deck with all that kit, just it just didn't add up and I didn't know what, what was going to be uh, the, the solution. But anyway, it, uh, it was easier um, once, once we'd done it. Anyway, th this, was, this is a, a historic photograph of, of Britannic. Um, so identical almost except she's got a lot more lifeboats than titanic had uh, and she was painted white um for during the war because she was a hospital ship uh, she she was launched in um just before the first world war and commandeered by the british government for conversion to a hospital ship so she ne she never realized her true ambition which was to be a transatlantic liner um, she would she was not even used as a troop ship she was uh, she was used purely as, as as a hospital ship and mainly serving the Gallipoli campaign um, this was my first view of Britannic as I was coming down the shot line uh, if we just knit back to the this side so I'm looking down at these bridge cutaways here uh, on on the ship so I'm I'm coming down onto the port side she's lying on her starboard side uh, and all you could see with this Im immense uh, flat area punctured by holes which were where the portholes were and then this this scalloped bridge area at uh, at the top um, so my, my camera was was coping at 4000 ISO fairly slow shutter speed the camera has good uh, in body uh, image stabilization uh, and I felt I was able to take the shutter speed down that far. I do feel like it would have been nice to have used a, a wider open aperture, uh, uh, sorry a, cl a 
a closed up aperture, maybe f8 or something like that, to get a bit more corner sharpness on the images. But it was needs must, and, I, and the reality of it was that I needed all the light to get into into the camera as as I possibly could. <clears throat> so you, the the way I I would set up the camera would would be dial in as you can see and, and what you'll see is that most of the images are f5.6 40th of a second um, but I would dial in auto ISO which means it would take anything between 100 and 10,000 uh, and so I would I would let the camera um, make the adjustments on 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 the fly so to speak if, if I felt that something was getting too bright I would use the um, expose a compensation button, so you could you could dial it down a bit, so that uh, you could you could you could change the appearance of things. But I didn't use that much. I, I I generally just just let the camera do do its thing, which is which left me the the job of choosing the composition and keeping myself alive on my rear breather and with all my kit, which was actually the mo most important thing to do. So th this this was on my first dive. Um, looking at the image now, it's a little bit soft, but uh, but there you go. Um, this is my buddy Luke, and we we went off uh, to explore the, the the front part of Britannic uh, in in the first place, um, and you, you can now start to see how the the effect of using high ISO actually works and so you can get these views of of the immense scale of of, of the ship so th this is at the break so this is where the the mine had hit the ship and the ship broke apart at this point so the top left one is obviously just ambient light alone whereas the the bottom one i think i was using a, a handheld video light which i would then um angle um appropriately to minimize any sort of backscatter and light up the bits and uh, that I was trying to photograph. Um, a view onto the foredeck. Um, norm, ordinarily that th this would have been a rejected shot, it's a little bit soft, um, but um, su such a, a view such of this looking down on the foredeck of, of Britannic, I, you just have to keep them in, in place and, and who knows what might happen with um, all these programs that are co coming out that uh, enable you to rescue images? Uh, and I've, I've I've got one um, coming up shortly, which which did just that. So I had I had this image, which was probably um, if we go back to to that one. I'm if you imagine I'm down here looking at the top of this little crane. Um, this is so this bit. Is the is the crane? So I'm I'm down at the crane. I'm looking. This is the very point of the bow, um, up the side, and that's the break in the hull. Um, the next image, this one, um, which so I've moved slightly forward of this, and and I'm I'm looking looking sort of back towards the bulk of the ship. Uh, this was very much a reject. It, it was it was very out of focus when I. Um, looked at it, but I, I just recently I decided to put it through Topaz Sharp and AI, and I was absolutely staggered with the improvements um, that that it made, such as that I I could actually I actually felt I could use it in this presentation. Um, so don't give up on those blurry images. You never know that you might be able to rescue them in a in uh, in a while. And who knows? I you know another five years time I might I might go back to this original image and run it through sharp and ai or its equivalent again and it might uh, do an even better job who knows but it is certainly worth considering for those images that have merit but uh, there's something not quite right with them this is one of my favorite images um, that i took during this dive um, uh, i'm i'm on this particular one uh, I'm diving with a different buddy. Uh, this is Scott Roberts, who's the expedition leader, um, and he, thankfully, had for me at any rate had these two superb Keldon video lights mounted to his scooter, and he was really happy to act as a a model for me 
um, and illuminate these scenes in in a way that meant that that I could capture them uh, and you know get really nice sharp images uh, despite the the high ISO that that I'm using. It, the, the anchor um, has a bit of history. So it, it, the, the anchor was made in um, the West Midlands and it was taken to Fleetwood in Lancashire and then it was transported to Belfast on a ship called the Duke of Albany, which I, funnily enough, I've also dived, which is now off Orkney and a, a, a scheduled protected wreck. Uh, as I say, that's another story. <clears throat> the, the, the one interesting thing about um, things Titanic stroke Britannic is that there's a there's a there's a mass of excess information about it and photographs uh, which I which I've been able to use in in this presentation. Um, when I was diving with Luke, he couldn't resist doing the uh, the full Kate Winslet at the at the bow. So there he is. Um, he he obviously kicked up a load of muck and the, uh, the the seabed was actually quite silty at the bottom, and so it was very easy to 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 disturb the visibility. <clears throat> but th th this is another view looking down on um, this is the bridge area um, and if you look at my cursor this this is one of the uh, telegraphs on the on the bridge uh, this is a second telegraph um, this is a likely to be a compass binnacle uh, there's more telegraphs up at the top end and this is one of the telemotor um, helms that were used to steer the ship. Um, a telemotor helm is, if you imagine it, it's it's a bit like power steering for for ships. Uh, so it, there was a, you know, if if any of you know anything about ships, you might have seen um, ships where the controls were all done by rope or even chains, um, but uh, this one uses hydraulics uh, and. Uh, that's how the the ship is steered. Um, funny enough, I was giving a talk at Ilfracombe Subaco Club a little while ago, and they had a raised telemotor helm uh, off off another ship sitting in the corner. So when it came to that point of the um, or this point of the uh, presentation, I was able to say them tell them that the telemotor helm is rather like the one that's sitting over there in the corner. Um, but anyway, so th this is a this is another view of the bridge. This is looking at the top part. Of the bridge so you can see the two telegraphs um, sitting there and then this is looking up from um, the lower telegraphs to one of the divers going past on his scooter at the at the top so the, the divers probably 15 to 20 meters away from me this being the the, the lower telegraphs um, and you can see how the ISO has, has dropped dramatically because I'm looking up towards the surface and I've, I've had to light up the, uh, the these bits to 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 get some some uh, color and definition onto them. So the 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 bridge was was an interesting feature that we we like to explore. So the the telegraphs were in in this part here and here. Um, you, you can see this is from a, a slightly more elevated view, and again you can see the telegraphs here and here uh, and. Uh, divers sort of exploring things. This is one of the lifeboat davits you can see here uh, and on same view there. Uh, one of the things that I, I was really intrigued with was the was the telemotor helm and, and th this is some some close-up views of the same thing. So th this is the telemotor helm and the, the interesting thing that, that, that I think is, is that it still has the remnants of the ship's wheel attached to it. So looking at my cursor, this is the boss of the wheel and this is the remnants of the spokes of the wooden ship's wheel. Um, you know, this is this is a view looking looking the other way. So um, you've, got, you've got the spokes <clears throat> against the contrasting floor um, there. <clears throat> there's there's um, a lot of lino tiles actually around the base of um, the telemotor helm. Now, I, I, I don't know whether that was um, a cost saving to use lino on Britannic when she was fitted out, because at that time, when she was fitted out, she would have, it would have been known that she was going to be used as a um, 
hospital ship rather than a fancy transatlantic liner. So I suspect they um, uh, decided to be rather more util utilitarian in their uh, fitting out. Um, the a lot of the tiles have sort of fallen away. Uh, we we were under very strict instructions not to interfere or remove anything from the wreck um, but uh, that wasn't the case on previous expeditions and i suspect a, a lot of those tiles are in various people's uh, display cabinets um, one other interesting thing uh, on on this is you can see this semicircular bit uh, at the top which shows this is a, a, a direction um, arrow if you like it, it it's showing the way the ship was turning um, in, it, in its last moments. <clears throat> um, just behind the bridge was the um, the officers' quarters, and it was really nice to come across something as 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 interesting as this. Uh, so there's a bath in there, and getting closer, you can see that the bath has four taps: um, hot, cold, and hot and cold. Um, it's annoying. I can't really make out what what each of these um, plaques says, but I suspect one of them is fresh water and one of them is salt water. And the, the other interesting thing on, on this is the plug is in. I wonder if the plug was in when the ship went down, but uh, it's one of those things we'll never know. Unfortunately, taking the plug out won't drain the water away. <clears throat> there were lots of other interesting things to see. There's big the ship had big rotary fans that were used to um, ventilate the interior. Um, and there was some quite a bit of um, fish life. There were, there were thousands of antheas all over all over the wreck. Uh, I came across this uh, Mediterranean moray. Um, a few people spotted scorpion fish. Uh, and as you saw from previous pictures, there's the, the whole upper structure is sort of covered with um, yellow sponges. Uh, very much a Mediterranean um, environment though, rather than tropical. Uh, the, the temperature at depth was about 13 degrees Celsius. Um, it gradually improved and there was a big thermocline at about 20 meters uh, and above 20 meters it, it sort of rose and then it ab above about nine meters it, it, it got even warmer so that in, in um, the final bits of deco that we were having to do, it was about um, 23, 24 degrees, uh, which was quite pleasant. Uh, obviously, there was there was a lot of uh, deco um, that we had to do. Uh, when we were doing the diving, we deployed these cylinders on the shot line, and so the, the, the last buddy pairings would have to bring the cylinders up at the end of each dive and we, we were using climbing rope ascenders to attach them to the shot line which meant it was then nice and easy to bring them back up uh, so they were brought back up each day and deployed again so <clears throat> the way that was done was that the the first two pairs as well as taking their own three cylinders would take an additional cylinder so they were jumping in with four cylinders uh, and they would deploy them um, at the at the um, side of the wreck in 85 meters uh, at the uh, 60 meter mark and then at the 20 meter mark uh, there was always a cylinder of um, 80 percent nitrox on the six meter decompression bar um, so the, uh, we've got a few more decompression and shot line images as, as you can imagine as, as a photographer uh, when you've got hours to to while away with nothing to do except sit there and wait for the, the clock to tick down. I did spend quite a bit of time taking photographs on the shot line. Um, the, one, the one I'm actually most pleased of is this, the one on the right hand side where every member of the expedition is on the, um, on the picture, obviously except me because I'm behind the camera, but every other person is, is there. Um, so uh, I was quite pleased with that one. And, and the, uh, the, the top left one shows the decompression bar, which we had at six meters uh, we, with a cylinder attached to it. There, there, was, there were actually two cylinders. There was a cylinder of air 
and a cylinder of um, 80%. The air was used if, if anyone wanted to have a drink, uh, which is, is easier said than done underwater, but you can do it, but it, you need to come off the rebreather and go open circuit to, to do so. Uh, we did have support divers, um, and this is um, uh, Zeno, who was our tireless um, person who filled cylinders for us and uh, did a lot of the uh, collecting of the bailout cylinders. The, the, the people who brought them up, they would, they would leave them at 20 metres and she would drop down. She's just wearing a single cylinder herself and she'd clip on four of the bailout cylinders and return to the surface to, uh, to get them taken off. So we, I, I was able to take some um, surface shots and you can see the, 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 the bottom two. I, I did on a dive where I decided to take in the um, 8 to 15 lens with the 1.4 teleconverter, which meant that I was able to get a, a, a slightly less wide view, which I thought would be useful for, for these two shots in particular. Um, and I, I think it worked uh, uh, in, in actual fact. Um, the the top left shot does show the clarity of the water, which was uh, which was lovely. Um, and uh, I've got a couple more. You can see the ladder of the of the boat we're using, very agricultural, but it did the job. Uh, and strangely, when you've offered, the the exit procedure was that you you'd swim to the boat, they would clip you on, and you'd you'd remove all your other kit except the rebreather and you'd only walk up the ladder when um, everything else was gone. So you were just carrying your rebreather, which weighs about the same as a um, 15 litre cylinder, perhaps a pony as well, or twin tens. Um, so it's it's not, not excessive. Uh, we, uh, we, we had to do a lot of organization uh, we got friendly with this cat here and um, there was a lot of oxygen pumping which had to be done at the end of each day the kia divers had a um, a booster pump which meant we were always able to get 200 bar oxygen fills which are pretty important when you're doing long dives which were in the region of four and a half hours um, for about a 30 to 40 minute bottom time on the on the wreck we also um, had National Geographic filming us, and uh, if you're familiar with the Drain the Oceans series, there is one episode called uh, Lost Giants, and uh, the story of our expedition is, is, is on that, uh, that episode. Uh, being Greece, there was interesting archaeology to go and look at. Um, we, we actually had Simon Mills, who's the owner of the Britannic Wreck, um, come along to, to join join us for a while and talk to us about about the wreck uh, and we were also able to do a little bit of recreational diving on on our rest days we probably shouldn't have done because it meant we were still getting um, nitrogen loading but uh, we kept the dive short um, this was a wreck of a paddle steamer called the Patrice which um, was in a much more modest depth of about 40 meters <clears throat> We had to do all the um, preparation of the rebreathers, change the, the soft and line charge, all the scooters, uh, wash out the dry suits that had leaked, um, and, um, and then obviously dry everything. But we all did have a bit of time for um, lunch. And one of, one of the things about being in Greece was that the restaurants stayed open until the small hours and it and it was actually invaluable and I, I hadn't realized how important it was until I went to Ireland last year to dive the Lusitania where you couldn't get a meal after about 8 30 in the evening and the problem was that we were getting back at, at sort of five o'clock trying to sort our kit out before the the food places shut whereas on in Greece you could spend your time um, as long as you liked and you, you could go and then go and get a table at 10 30 in, at night and have a, have a super meal uh, and, and that really helped us to be quite honest obviously i've looked at the bow but then there, there is time 
we were really lucky with the with the weather. We didn't loss, lose any days to, to bad weather. So we got a, a, a full quota of five dives on Britannic. So we were able, able to spend some diving, uh, diving the stern. And th this is an amazing photo, historic photograph of Olympic, which just shows the, the massive scale of, um, of the ship com compared to, uh, to people. Uh, and, th and there's another one here. Um, if you look at my cursor, there's a man standing at the bottom of this, looking looking up towards the uh, the hull of uh, of the ship. This also is is Olympic, <clears throat> but uh, on the right is is my photograph of coming down the shot line uh, to one of the one of the props, the, the port side propeller. <clears throat> so the the port side propeller was was um was the was the one that was responsible for the only fatalities that occurred um on britannic the there are 30 something people died uh on on the uh, during the sinking but it wasn't that they went down with the ship they um decided they were going to release their lifeboat before the captain had given them the all clear to do so. And the reason that he hadn't given them the all clear was that the ship's propellers were still turning. And what happened was that the lifeboat was sucked into the wash of the propeller and then chopped into matchwood along with a number of people, which is a pretty horrific way to go. But um, that, uh, that is actually what, what happened. Um, you can see the dimensions of these propellers. They, they are vast things. Um, amazing bits of um, uh, machinery. The the outer props are actually four pieces, so they made they're made of a, a central boss with the blades bolted on, whereas the middle boss is a is a one piece casting. Um, I think this shot was taken shortly after the the original shot at down looking down towards the the propeller, and that's Scott Roberts attempting to secure. The, um, the shot line in, in, a, in a good place so that it, it doesn't get pulled away so the other, other divers could, uh, could join, join us. Um, I'd gone down first with Scott and um, we'd been able to uh, deploy our deep bailout cylinder, which is this, this here, and then Scott was just uh, sorting out the, uh, the, the shot line and making it secure. But it, it just gives the scale of, of these massive propellers. Uh, one of the things Simon Mills asked me to do was to take a photograph that that showed all three propellers. Um, and this was the one that I, I managed to get for him. Uh, I, I'd swum down to the seabed and placed a video light on the seabed and then backed off uh, to get this shot. Um, I'm quite pleased with it. You know, it's annoying there are so many small fish in the way um but uh, that's the way it is couldn't couldn't get them to move out of the way this um strange um thing dropping down is is a, is an old fishing net that obviously got snagged on on the wreckage at some stage in the past it's it's not monofilament it's old heavy stuff so it's probably been there for years and years um th this is a and another view after I'd placed the video light. So we've got the lower prop, then the central four bladed one, <clears throat> and then looking through the opening towards the, the upper port side propeller. Once, once we'd looked around the propellers, we, we took a, a tour towards the, um, the rear accommodation. Um, there should have been some more telegraphs here, but we failed to look for them actually we forgot about looking for them but um uh, this is again this is scott roberts lighting it all up for me and then a bit later on he he dips down underneath this superstructure to to have a look and see what's uh, what's in there um one of one of the um things that really struck me was the massive lifeboat davits which uh, they're all in the deployed position which you know, it, it's a testament in a way to um, the fact that it that it worked on Britannic where where it failed on Titanic. Um, that they were a, they were a slightly um, unusual 
um, style and design, but but it but it worked for them. I, in and slide or two, I think I've got a historic photograph which shows the arrangement. Um, one of the things I, I was just going to point out was all these ropes, some of which are, um, I think, actually um, old shot lines. But, you know, that there have not been many expeditions to um, Britannic, but there have been quite a number. And the, the, the wreck site, which is why this photograph is in here, is about where that container ship goes over, um, goes across. The, 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 the wreck site is, is right in the path for navigation. And we were leaving our um, shot lines in place. And on one occasion, we came back and the shot line was gone. And almost certainly um, a passing big ship probably clipped it and, and either tore it off or cut the boy off. And in which case the rope would have dropped back to the seabed. Um, and I think it might become more of an issue if more and more people start going to the wreck. Um, because obviously if, if each expedition loses a couple of uh, shot lines, it, it, it ends up being quite a lot of rope strewn across across the wreck. Yeah, this, this is the, um, the the design of, of, of the lifeboat davits. So they had sort of um, a sort of conveyor belt like a, um, a escalator with with the lifeboats on so that they could um, launch them easily and they had enough of them so that all people on the boat could be rescued. Um, the perhaps the the redeeming feature of um, her sinking was that she was en route to pick up um, wounded soldiers. She wasn't coming back. I, th I think it might have been a very different story if she'd sunk um, coming back from um, Gallipoli with um, her sort of rooms full of wounded soldiers who were perhaps some of them were not mobile. I think then it might have been a very different story. Uh, she, she, the, the Britannic actually sank far quicker than Titanic, despite the improvements made to um, the hull design. She actually sank in just over an hour. Um, whereas, obviously, as we know, Titanic took several hours to sink. Um, one of the thoughts is that although the watertight type doors on Britannic had been improved and made much better, the fact that she um, hit a mine meant that a lot of the watertight doors and their tracks and so on became distorted and so that they couldn't close the watertight doors when when they actually needed to um, but i guess you can't you can't um cater for all eventualities no matter no matter how how hard you try even modern ships would uh, would succumb if um if if they're the hole in them is 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 so extensive so we we were able to do a, do a dive taking in the uh, the, the lifeboat davits, which were, which was also you know quite interesting. And I think here you can see the um, the sponges lit lit up by the uh, the torchlight, <clears throat> and looking at uh, the the top of our um, when th this is beside our shot line that we were we were going back to the surface on. Um, and looking at the the top of one of these these davits. This is the um, this is a Team 3 photograph. Um, so I, I I was trialing their new membrane dry suit, which which worked which worked to treat, um, and uh, um, I, I still use it now. Um, one of the interesting things about Britannic is that you know that. The, the White Star Line created all this publicity for her as a as a um, luxury um, steamer. Um, it it never happened. She she never got there, um, unfortunately. And I've I've been asked a, a few times how do Olympic class vessels compare with modern cruise ships? Well, they're they're, they're tiny in comparison to uh, the allure of the seas, which looks far too too vast for my liking. But um, uh, that, that that's a good um, sort of pictorial um, illustration of of the, of the difference in in size of these ships. I, on one of the dives, in, in fact, one of the ones I was um, having a look at the um, lifeboat davits, I came across 
this plaque. Um, th this plaque had been put there in the 1997 uh, expedition by um, Kevin Gurr. Uh, in 1997, this, this was mainly an open circuit uh, expedition, and the stories of him having this plaque, which I can assure you weighs a lot because they, they actually made a duplicate, which I've managed to sign the back of. Um, they, he had it strapped to his twin set, and apparently when he jumped in, he plummeted to the wreck and uh, his his bodies found him upside down on, on the side of the ship, unable to do very much because it weighed so much. Uh, but they got it, got him up, up the right way, got the plaque off and, and then put it on, on the wreck. Uh, I was quite surprised that it hadn't picked up any um, appreciable um, incrustation. Uh, you know, since 97, it's it's um, it, it, it's quite 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 a, a, a time. The the text if, if is at, at the bottom right is what's written on the uh, on the plug. Um, the big discovery on the final dive of our expedition was that uh, one of the American divers, Joe Masrani, um, thinks he discovered the ship's bell. Um, the there was a there was a lot of talk about the ship's bell um and in fact in in some of Cousteau's um records he talks about the ship's bell being just below the crow's nest uh on the on the forward mast uh, he doesn't say that he recovered it um but he was quite happy to say that he recovered all sorts of other interesting stuff so we think we think he probably would have said he recovered it if, if he had done. Um, I, I think the most likely explanation is that it's probably a fairly basic bell. Again, it was probably a ut utilitarian bell. It's probably not too big and it probably doesn't say Britannic on it. Um, but anyway, Joe Masrani found this um, thing on the um, bottom left. Um, and this is actually a, a GoPro frame grab. So, but I, I, I ran it through Topaz Gigapixel AI, which has really enhanced it significantly compared to the, the, the frame grab, to the extent that, you know, it, it is sort of recognizable that, that that could well be a bell with its hanger um, uh, attached. So um, we were very pleased to have, have been, to have found this. The Greek authorities have been told, and they obviously want to leave it where it is. The, the difficulty with something like that is that you can see that it's um, there's a lot of shell and so on that's around it and, and in time it's, it's actually going to become buried. So uh, the Simon Mills would like it recovered um, and I, I think the Royal Navy would like it recovered. Obviously, although it was a hospital ship, it was a military hospital ship, so it, it was an HMHS. So it was a naval, naval vessel at the time of her sinking. Um, but at the moment, it remains where it is um, at the bottom of the Aegean Sea. Um, and uh, I have a feeling that's where it's going to remain. This is um, our dive team and uh, a, a, a rogues gallery, if you like, um, with, our, with our rebreathers and scooters. Um, one of the things that we we I think were very lucky about was that um, the weather was actually unseasonably cold for that time of year in in Kia, and it for some reason it meant that the the winds were very light the whole time we were there, and um, I spoke earlier about the need for scooters. In actual fact, we probably could have got away without them. Um, they were useful to have because you could cover a lot of ground um, with one without having to thin, which um, exerting too much at the mega depths we were operating at does um, increase your risk of decompression. So they, they were good from that point of view. But um, all in all, it was a great expedition and I was really pleased to be part of it. I can endorse Rick's book, by the way, it's great. 
I've read it twice. It was just as good the second time round. So yeah, I agree with Alex. 